There are few living people who have had as great an impact on how the world stands today as Henry Kissinger. He has advised American presidents since the 1960s, stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Chairman Mao, Golda Meir and Vladimir Putin, changed the fortunes of countries in ways that are still admired, condemned and debated. 70 years ago, as a young man at Harvard, Kissinger wrote that in the life of every person there comes a point when he realises that out of all the seemingly limitless possibilities of his youth, he has in fact become one actuality. One's journey across the meadows has indeed followed a regular path. Having just celebrated his 100th birthday, you might imagine Henry Kissinger's path is now set. In fact, he is plainly still involved in public life, still talking to leaders around the world. His legacy can be felt from Cuba to Cairo, but we've broken this interview into three geographic parts. Europe, where he was born, the United States, where he found power and fame, and Asia, which he transformed. And then we have a more personal epilogue to do with that legacy. Henry Kissinger was born in 1923 in the German town of Furth. Two years later, Adolf Hitler came to the town to denounce its Jewish citizens. I began by asking Henry Kissinger how his first 15 years of persecution and chaos, which only ended when his family escaped to America in 1938, has shaped his world view. I spent my youth within a disintegrating society. Uh, the German society was collapsing into the Hitler period. So that gradually, in each election, the Nazi period, party gained. And then when Hitler finally came to power, I, together with all my family and all the people I knew well, became part of a discriminated minority, uh, living in a town in which there were signs at every public place that Jews are not welcome here. And at the entrance to every town when you entered it by train or car or anywhere. So that was my youth. Do you think that your view of the world, of something that needed some degree of order, if you look back... Well, I, I believe that for a society or for a group in which people lived, uh, stability was a precondition for creativity. Now, that's not a thought I had then so precisely, but stability meant a great deal. The next time you came back to Germany was in the war. You came back as a soldier. You, you fought in the Battle of the Bulge. You saw the concentration camps. You helped, you took part in this of uh, the rounding up of Nazis, all by the age of, like, 24, 25. That is a hinterland that very few people in modern politics have. If you look at the people you dealt with, de Gaulle, Mao, all those people, that they had seen warfare. Well, I came back to Germany as a rifleman in the 84th Infantry Division of the US Army. And... Uh, so I saw war in its most immediate form under circumstances in which your fellowship with your fellow soldiers is your hope of survival. Mm. And everything depends on it. And I was lucky that my fellow soldiers of that period were from northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin, uh, it was called the Rail Splitter Division after Lincoln. Mm. And so that was the environment. So then as the battle neared the German border, after the bat during the Battle of the Bulge, I was transferred to intelligence. 
which was still at the front, but not right in it, about two miles back at the, in the civilian population. But so I saw the impact of authoritarianism and totalitarianism in my youth and of war in the next period. And so it was an experience which is so elemental that it becomes part of you uh, because it shows both the dangers, but also the sense of unity of, of, of a community when, when they believe in fundamental. We know today that uh, German tanks were probably better than our tanks. Mm. But you could never convince American soldiers of this <laughs> because they were convinced that if better tanks could be built, we'd be building them. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. For most of your life, you were dealing with world leaders who had, a, had, had somewhat similar experiences. You could, you could argue, you know, but they'd seen combat. The, but the last American president to be in that state was the first President Bush. You look around the leaders of the Western world now, they're all people, some of them closer to my age than yours, who've never seen those things. And I wonder whether you think that makes a difference to world politics. Do you worry about that with today's leaders? I think that leaders who have not had an experience of catastrophe or at the edge of catastrophe sometimes believe they have more options than they really do. Interesting. And that uh, that is characteristic of our time, especially in the West. Because the one exception possibly is Xi Jinping, because he went through the Cultural Revolution, didn't he? So he would have had some experience of the terror that you would have seen. Well, for Xi, a crucial experience was living in a cave with his father after his father, a Red Army leader, was purged by Mao. And in his conversations before he became president, he would refer to the fact that this experience made him strong. As you said, you grew up in this period of chaos and disintegration. Um, you are seen to be somebody who, who wants to, does not want Russia if it loses the war in Ukraine, to be overly punished? Is that, is that in part because you saw what happened to Germany? The Germany before the First World War was a very, seemed a very proud, successful com country. The best universities, the best, all these things. And then humiliation and disintegration follows. Do you worry about that with Russia? I worry about the fact that Russia has been integral part of European history for 600 years and in a very special way because it is infinitely larger than any European mm. country and it has always been part of Asia, the Middle East and Europe. That's a unique aspect of Russia in comparison to the European countries. So it has been torn throughout its history between a desire to become fully European and a fear of European technical uh, superiority or capacity. Europe will become more stable, the world will become more stable when 
Russia accepts the fact that it cannot conquer Europe, uh, but it has to remain part of Europe by some sort of consensus, as other states do. Uh, but I don't want Russia so crushed that it sees it being a factor of international politics in other regions and becomes a subject for European competition among the various states. So it is important for Ukraine to be preserved and for Ukraine to emerge from the war as an autonomous, strong and democratic country. We have substantially achieved this objective hmm. by now. Uh, it can still be improved in terms of the borders of Ukraine uh, in the what I hope will be the concluding phases of the war. But I would prefer to preserve Russia because the dissolution of Russia or the re reduction of Russia to resentful impotence uh, would set up a new set of tensions. Do you think Vladimir Putin is somebody who could live with that parameter? You said you want a Russia that doesn't, that realizes where its borders are. Well, I have to remember two things about Vladimir Putin that he is, on one level, the inheritor of traditional Russia and therefore has the tendencies towards assertion that I've described earlier. But there's also uh, a Vladimir Putin who grew up in the seats of Leningrad in which a, over half of the population died of starvation uh, and under, under constant threat. But he has translated that into never wanting European military power to be in easy reach of St. Petersburg and major cities like Moscow. So when the border of Europe at the end of the war, which was the military border of Europe, which was in the center of Europe, moved to within 300 miles of Moscow and maybe 50 miles of St. Petersburg, he reacted very strongly. And as it turns out, at the edge of irrationality. You once said to me that Vladimir Putin was more Dostoevsky than Hitler. Do you still think of him in that way? Yeah, I think he's a Dostoevsky-type figure beset by ambivalences and unfulfillable aspirations, but not devoted to power in the abstract, uh, but very capable of using uh, power. And as it turned out, he used it excessively in relationship uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. I would like a Russia to rec a, that recognizes that its relations to, but to Europe have to be based on agreement and a kind of consensus. And I believe that this war will, if it ended properly, may make it achievable. If it's ended on the terms you're describing, do you think Vladimir Putin can survive in power? It's improbable. On the other side of the fence, at the moment we have the Ukrainian counteroffensive seems to have begun. Do you see that as the last offensive before you, you have to move to diplomacy and 
peace talks of some sort? Well, I began to urge moving towards diplomacy a year ago when I urged that the various parties to the conflict ask themselves how they want to end it. Not that they would end it right at that point, but that they would know what their political aims were. I think that becomes increasingly important as time goes on, lest we wind up in a, at a point where the war becomes its own objective and where military operations and military relations between powers uh, dominate all of this geopolitical thinking. And at that point, countries like China will have to become, from their point of view, increasingly active, and that would spread it into a world conflict. Do you, do you think that that is actually the real danger, that the Donbass doesn't become Europe's frontier with Russia? It becomes sort of Europe's frontier with China, that, that Russia gets driven back into the arms of China? Well, it could happen because Russia gets driven back or because Russia collapses and disintegrates as a functioning major autonomous state. And therefore it requires thought in this current phase, which I support. I think we were correct in resisting the attack on Ukraine. We talked about China and Russia. One power that could emerge much more powerfully from this particular episode is Germany. Germany is probably the country that's going to rebuild Ukraine if it happens. It may be involved in rebuilding Russia. Um, and within Europe, if you visit Spain, if you visit Italy, you can feel that the frontier of Europe has been dragged to the east. So the centre of Europe is now closer to Berlin, so to speak. And that Germany, by the fact it's been involved in supplying more arms and everything like that, that it is, it looks set to become a bigger power in Europe. Do you agree with that, firstly? And secondly, do you think that Germany is ready for that task? I agree that the, with this description of the transformation of, of the centre of gravity in Europe, it's been inherent since before World War I and was one of the causes of World War I because of the refusal of other countries to accept this reality, but also because of the inability of Germany to understand the transformation of its own position because the leading country has to be an example of moderation and wisdom in balancing the interests of all the countries if they are to be participants in the system and Historically, uh, Germany wanted to exercise its potential by domination. And its tragedy has been, after the retirement of Bismarck, the failure to learn this lesson, which dragged it into two training wars, which altered the entire position of Europe in the world. So now it has, is again in this position, and it has no leaders with an experience of either the Nazi period or of the war. Mm. 
So they have to construct the system by themselves. And they're new, they're in office only a year or so. And this is not a reflection on their abilities, but a description of a new challenge for them that hasn't existed in that form before. Do you think that it also causes problems for the other great powers? You know, you, you wrote a lot of history about containing, you know, first containing France, then containing well, Germany. And now that now there is an issue, you know, if you, if you are France... Well, if, if Germany if, was in conflict with France since the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century because French policy was explicitly based on maintaining the balance of power within Central Europe, which in practice meant maintaining a division of Germany between mm. competing states. And France, partly to mistakes that Germany made, and Britain came to look at Germany as a threat to its sea power. So when the wall fell, the, neither the British nor the French leader were enthusiastic about the unification of Germany. But the reality is that a British Prime Minister in the 80s and 70s, when Germany was unified, as the last major European country to be unified in 1871, said, said this will have a greater impact than the French Revolution. So we are at this moment now when a new structure of Europe has to be created mm. based on this reality. And I'm describing the challenge here. Not the, uh, I'm not saying that the Germans have failed. It's new, and it's a new challenge for this generation. It's also a challenge for on France and Britain, very quickly. They followed very different paths, especially since Suez. You know, France has, has very much defined itself often in opposition to America, and it's buried itself in the European Union. The British, by contrast, have tended to stick with the Americans, and now they are outside the European Union. And you and I can argue about who's got things right over the past 50 years, but we are where we are. And I wonder, you look at France and you look at Britain now, who is better placed to go forward? Britain outside the European Union, France inside it. Psychologically, Britain is better placed because in the structure of the world that one can imagine appearing, uh, whatever Europe does to its own construction, it, cooperation with America and pursuing parallel policies with America will have to be an essential component on it because by itself opposing all the other major power centers, uh, Europe is in a difficult position to do that and it may be impossible. So Britain historically is better placed uh, uh, to do it. Uh, Britain's problem is its connection, how to connect with Europe, not how to connect with the United States. It has the history of the special partnership and an instinctive fear in Britain that the danger comes from across the oceans and uh, uh, comes from across the border, while in Europe the instinctive fear is the 
danger comes from land invasion. So for Britain to link to Europe has turned out to be not possible organically. So it now has to be done by policy. And I think that... So you, you, actually, you actually think Britain would... I would, might disagree with you on this, but you think that Britain is sort of psychologically happier outside the, the European Union? Yes, I think it is. And I think it's also a great opportunity for it to act as a link between a unifying Europe and America. America has never been true to itself unless it meant something beyond itself. Henry Kissinger said those words about his adopted homeland in 1973. He first arrived in the United States in 1938 as a 15 year old refugee. I began the second part of our conversation about the United States by asking if his life story was uniquely American. Could he have achieved what he has done anywhere else? Absolutely uniquely American. I was uh, at a dinner in Germany where the German Chancellor of the Democratic Germany was present and the uh, American ambassador rather amazingly asked the Chancellor, what would have happened to me in Germany <laughs> if I had survived into this period? And he said, I would be a junior professor in Munich at Munich University. That brings us very nice. That brings us very nicely to the next phase of your life. You, you go to Harvard. I think at different times of your life, you had thought about chemistry and being an accountant, which is a wonderful image. Um, but one of your mentors, Fritz Kramer, had a phrase about you were you, you were musically tuned to history. You go to Harvard, and the other kind of great figure of your youth, Bill Elliott, a professor at Harvard directs you towards the philosophy of history, rather than just history itself. And that's where you get all the Kant or the Spinoza. Is that a really important difference? You know, you, you, you've always been obsessed not just by history, but the ideas behind it. Later on in life, my views and those of many of the academic community at Harvard can be charitably described as not parallel. <laughs> uh, but in that period of my life, which in a funny way was a second immigration into America, uh, the first from Germany and the second from the army, hmm. uh, Harvard played a very important role because it gave me uh, confidence or inspiration, it's a better word, into the direction. I was sort of divided. I was doing extremely well in chemistry, mostly based on memory. And I went to see the head of the chemistry department. His name was Professor Kistiakowski became a very well-known figure. Uh, and I asked him whether I should major in chemistry. And he said, if you have to ask me, no. <laughs> and so this then, but I, I was on that other course already inwardly. It gave me the confidence to do it. The philosophy, I was most interested at first in philosophy, in theory of knowledge and theory of values. Mm. But history is a way to combine the inherent uncertainties 
of philosophy inherent because so far no absolute answers have ever been found by any civilization with the results of what actually happened. And so as I progressed, I progressed in development. Uh, I became very, uh, philosophy of history became my dominant theme. And I think if one reads my books, that theme runs through all of them. Where in your life has that, that idea of the philosophy of history been most, most the, the ideas been most challenged by reality? You know, you've said that history is interesting because you get reality conflicting no, with the uh, ideas. No, life, is, uh, life is torn between managing the present and the evolution of the present so that in individual lives and, of course, magnified into society's lives, there's always the ambiguity that emphasis on the present leads to stagnation and that, therefore, everything else around you will outstrip that society. And so how to strike that balance between ultimate values and what reality imposes on you. Uh, and reality is never quite adequate, but ultimate values are too absolute because they demand a degree of imposition on others. Uh, how to strike that balance it's maybe, it's maybe given to us as our insoluble problem to keep our motivation at the appropriate level. Isn't that quite interesting? Isn't that also the story of, of American foreign policy? You have this, you, you've always argued that there's this set of ideals that America wants to yeah, live up to. It's, it's a special problem for America yeah. because we have it been as close as it is possible to be, to be satisfied with where we are. And we've been protected by two great oceans, because whenever a society in the, almost every place else, every place else was tempted to be excessively satisfied with itself, its neighbors intruded on them. It was very difficult to do that in America because of these oceans. But after World War II, and now increasingly so, uh, and now with uh, artificial intelligence, totally so, uh, we are part of an international or global system. And it, it goes beyond international, it goes beyond its universal system. And we have simultaneously to adjust to that and conduct a day-to-day -day policy uh, with countries that have the same situation and with other countries that grow up to our level of uh, achievement that's never existed before in history. You've always said America should balance a sort of shining city on a hill complex with reality and you you look at the last you look at the the last cold war and america won it by kind of singing a song of liberty of those ideals but also by doing really basic things helping people the marshall plan and things like that if you go to america's allies they will say america doesn't talk about those ideals any longer it just talks about america first and in terms of trade deals and things like that, America isn't, you know, it's not even doing trade deals with its allies in either, Amer either Asia or Europe. So that America, in a strange way, is more disconnected from what it should be than it has been. Well, actually, in fact, America is not more disconnected. It's probably, and 
more connected than it's been mm. in what is considered the great period of American history, except that during the Marshall Plan at the end of World War II, all this was new. So it was an, a new experience, and it was therefore, uh, it became very significant in day-to-day -day thinking of policymakers. Now policymakers are torn between, and at that time we had over 50% of the world's gross national product. Now we are down to about 24%, which is still a huge percentage and still a extremely influential percentage. But it requires us to be more discriminating. So it looks as if we are retrenching. The problem that bothers me is not basically the retrenching, but the, we have not yet found a concept that unifies Americans. And so now the advocacy of the realization that we need a new idea for world order has shrunk to a much smaller group than existed at the end of World War II. Our challenge is conceptual more than practical. When you came to power, America had had a long period where it had been able to, to lecture the world. America was going through great difficulties then, not, you know, it was going through things, you had the gas price, you had all these things going wrong, and America didn't, it, you had to scramble, you had to try and find allies, you had to try and make things work. You've had another period, you know, from the Berlin Wall onwards, where, where America seemed very strong, now again it's, it's stuck having to make allies, having to find balances. Is, is there a comparison there at all? We... Now, I'm living in, an, in, in a world of uh, unprecedented complexity. Uh, the need for allies exists, but what allies are supposed to do in given circumstances and how the alliances are supposed to operate when every issue has a global component, but not, not every issue has a comparable interest for every country, so that countries, they all have a global interest in global mm. stability, but they don't have the same interest in the immediate situation. Secondly, there has now, when I was given the opportunity to participate in policy making. That was essentially the 70s and, and early 80s. All these issues we are discussing were beginning in their, were in their infancy. And uh, so that their very existence was in dispute. And one of the contributions of Nixon was that he was willing to face these new, uh, these new realities. But now they're upon us. Uh, and in that sense, there is an evolution of the problems, uh, as, you seem, as you suggest in your question. Do you think now America is a worse ally? I mean, if you go to, if I go to Paris or I go no, to Jakarta, um, they, they will say all we hear from America is we hear America first and we hear we don't want to do trade deals, we don't want to do things with you. There is no, there is no sense of reaching out and they would probably say that Joe Biden is a little bit more polite than, than well, Donald I Trump. I would say... But no more helpful. The debate within America has shifted to the extremes. So the difference between, say, 
liberal Republicans and Democrats in the 70s and 80s was about the degree of a participation in which they both shared. In the present period, the debate had shifted to extremes in which there is an extreme theory of America first, which is applied on both sides, but in such a way that it, that it focuses too much on American interests and not on global interests. That is a challenge. But anyone who wants to conduct a serious American foreign policy must balance the two or America will become isolated. Do you think the current administration is, is, is doing a serious job at that? I think the current administration is trying to do a serious job of that, but it is so afraid of attacks on itself that it doesn't do itself justice. You were a Rockefeller Republican. Nowadays, there are no Rockefeller Republicans. There's, there's, there's Democrats on one extreme, there's Republicans on the other. The center of American politics, the fact it's disappeared, do you, do you, do you think that, that has dramatic foreign policy implications? Well, <clears throat> I think that center still exists, but it doesn't have fully, it has, doesn't have an articulate expression yet. Would you ever like to see an independent party in America? Well, independent parties in America have not had a good fate. Yes. But I do want, think it is important to maintain an, an argument for the philosophy that I have maintained. Not because I have maintained it, but because it reflects the necessity of our period, and that becomes magnified if you consider the, that we are now in the field of artificial intelligence at the very beginning of a colossal transformation of human consciousness, which will have to be built into this foreign policy. But we have a paradox, don't we? You have these issues. You have artificial intelligence. You have climate change. You have maybe the global economy, where interconnectedness is incredibly important, no, uh, but that, America, America that doesn't seem to follow the, it. That is in the current world. Uh, but the essence of what I'm concerned about is that we have opened the door to a dialogue with objects and with machines. That's a, that when, when the printing press was in, invented, it transformed the human consciousness and set off what we call now the Enlightenment, which has been going on for 500 years. Now we are, these machines, what is the essence of these machines? We ask a question of these machines. These machines are then capable of encompassing all the knowledge that we have taught them, but that we cannot contain in one brain or one machine. Look at it, give us an answer, and we act on the basis of that. That is a new reality that, has, that will be studied for decades. Like the old new reality was when uh, the printing press permitted exchanging information easily. But the printing, so, the printing press was at a time of nation states or where nation states were coming to the fore, where you, you had an immediate need to interact with other ones. It was part of what appeared. AI is coming part in, as you've described, in America, which 
is not is not doesn't have borders. No, no, but I Earth. think America will be driven by reality in studying what I've, and so will all other countries. It's not an American thing, but it's become a high tech thing. So therefore, it will be a dialogue between. Uh, therefore, the dialogue between America and China will become more important. Oh, even more crucial, but it will change the way we interpret reality because due to our achievement, we have found the key to a new aspect of reality which we didn't know existed. One, one last thing on America, given the huge complexity of what you've described, do you think that a presidential election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump offers somebody who is capable of dealing with that degree of complexity? It's going to be very difficult. It's a, it's, it's a painful question. We have to live with what exists. And we mustn't turn our disputes into civil wars. The third part of our conversation centred on Asia, perhaps the place where Kissinger has had the most enduring impact. For most people now, that impact is represented by China, which Kissinger and Richard Nixon helped open up to the West. But his first encounter with Asia, and the area of his life his critics focus on, was Indochina. I put it to Kissinger that although Nixon and he plainly inherited a mess in Vietnam in 1968, by 1975, North Vietnam had taken control of Saigon and Cambodia, which America had bombed, was a disaster. I asked him whether from the perspective now of nearly 50 years, there was anything he would have done differently. I honestly believe we did the best we could. We inherited a war in which 550,000 Americans, now 500,000 were in place, and 50,000 more had already been ordered to go there and were on their way uh, to go there. In America, public opinion had turned in a significant way against the war and in violent demonstrations uh, in the streets. Among our, the international public, everybody was against the war, but they also were for America defending them. So our credibility around the world depended as it does today, on our ability to perform the tasks we had assigned ourselves. We have comparable problems today in issues in Taiwan and elsewhere, Ukraine. So our decision was to try to end the war under conditions in which we, in which the control over their own destiny became, fell more and more into the hands of the South Vietnamese. We gradually withdrew our troops, conducted negotiations, but also conducted enough military operations so that our adversary now quasi-ally, but our then adversary did not become convinced that he could take over. Uh, we did not want an Afghan, what later was an Afghanistan-style withdrawal, which was for 2,500 people. We had 550,000 people, plus a million armed Vietnamese in place. So was it at every stage conducted with the absolutely 
we would say a better way at any one point. We didn't think so. I still don't think so, but uh, I'm open to that argument. But but what is meant by better? We reduced American casualties substantially so that by the last year of the war, they were in the thousands. Uh, when the Nixon administration came in, they were reduced to less than a hundred in the last year of the war. And we withdrew from ground combat within two years. At all times, maintaining a negotiation. The irreducible demand we had was an autonomous democratic government in South Vietnam. That was not granted until the last three months of the war, which is why they were the last three months of the war. At that point, we settled. But then the next question became, could we maintain the settlement? We believed that we could maintain the settlement as we did in South Korea, against all but an all-out invasion from the north, at which point alliance issues would have arisen. But we believed against foreseeable infiltrations. We could maintain the autonomy of the, of the government, and we could maintain it against even significant attacks but then Watergate occurred within two months of the settlement. And the Congress, reflecting public opinion, forbade any kind of military action in, over, and near Vietnam. At that point, uh, we, it w had become it had destroyed the bases. It was painful. It was the saddest moment of my public life when I had to sit in the security advisor's office and recommend the final withdrawals. And I published in my memoirs conversations with President Ford to show how painful he found it to agree to these recommendations. I think the time we gained enabled us, by the time the war was ended, we had already opened to China. and. That, in turn, what China had opened to us, either way. But that was the crucial turning point of the Cold War. And also uh, created a structure from which we could have maintained, or at least given the Vietnamese a reasonable chance. During the debates and the pressures, many things were said that can now be used to indicate different views, but this was our essential views. And I'm sure that any later books that are written on the subject that have access to material will see that this was what we thought and acted on. Very quickly on that, you think the, in the end, the end in the end justified all the collateral damage of hanging on there? No, the Cambodia, end the, for us, uh, the end we were aiming for was an honourable peace. By honourable peace, we meant a peace in which we did not turn over the people who had relied on us 
to the domination of those whom they had fought relying on our promises. That was our definition of the end. We honestly believed that we had achieved that. And in presenting his proposal, the North Vietnamese negotiator, Lee Duc Tho, the crucial point was in October 1972, when the North Vietnamese negotiated, turned over a proposal and then read it to us and said, this is essentially what President Nixon had proposed in January. At that point, I asked for a recess. And my closest associate at that point was a man called Winston Lord, mm. who went on to a distinguished career. And he had thought of resigning at the time we uh, fought in Cambodia. And I told him then, you have two choices. You can go outside and walk around with a placard, or you can help end this war. And so at that moment, I turned to Winston, who was just American at that point, and I turned to him and I said, we've done it. It turned out to be a sad statement because we hadn't because we could not maintain the domestic support that was needed to sustain it. Uh, but the effort, if the effort had not been made, and if we had gone to either of the other extreme solutions, one of which was to go all out upon coming into office before the ground had been laid with Russia and China or to withdraw unconditionally and try to extricate hundreds of thousands of troops while the enemy was still around them in the form and the local people might have turned against us was uh, was not uh, was not acceptable, and there were no other terms that could have been uh, ne uh, negotiated. Uh, that was the reality uh, that we faced, and so, in retrospect, President Nixon came to believe. And actually, I thought already at that time we should have considered a more all-out military solution at the beginning. But on reflecting about it, at the time we had had assassinations in America mm. and already violent demonstrations, that was probably more theoretical than practical. So that was our thinking. Of course, that is all, will always be debated. The other bit which you, you mentioned as being in part a reason why staying there made sense was China. From that point of view, you went there, you well, opened it up. It was important for us to show uh, we ended off it convinced that a country of the magnitude of China and the history of China could not be kept out of the international system. And that we could not keep it out of the international system, that it would find a way to enter it. And so we began efforts to open relations. At that moment, China had withdrawn all its ambassadors from every country in the world except uh, two, uh, 
Poland and Egypt. And Poland was maintained in the Geneva Agreement of 1954 uh, as a contact point between America and China. And negotiations began on a regular basis, uh, that is, between the ambassadors. They had, there were 162 meetings between 1954 and 1971. None lasted more than a day, because each began with the Chinese demanding the immediate return of Taiwan to China, and with the Americans demanding that uh, China affirm its commitment to a commitment to a peaceful evolution of the process. Neither demand was accepted. And so we began from that basis uh, and then went through many contortions to establish contact and exploring many ways of possibly doing it. And finally found a way when President Nixon told Jacob Khan in Pakistan that we wanted contact, uh, that to convey to the Chinese that we wanted a real dialogue. And we emphasized it uh, by sending an ambassador in Poland, the ambassador in Poland, to approach the Chinese ambassador at any social function to which all ambassadors were invited, which turned out to be a Yugoslav fashion show, <laughs> one normally doesn't associate with Yugoslavia. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we uh, approached him, and it was at that moment we the Ambassador, a few weeks later, drove up to our office, to our embassy, and said they were ready to begin negotiations. Those are the contortions through which things were conducted at the time. But from there, we worked together with China on the specific problem of enabling in a dialogue which gave Russia something additional to think about and then led to the easing of the Cold War and the culmination of the Vietnamese agreements and to subsequent evolution of Chinese-American relations. There's always a metaphor where I think the first time you said we were in the foothills of a new Cold War and then we went up to the mountain passes, then the world was on a precipice looking over. But each time we talk, the relationship between America and China seems to be worse. Is that, is that true today? I'd say we are now at the top of a, the precipice. <laughs> and one of the big problems is both sides need to step back from it simultaneously. If one of them steps back, it is falling. So both have to decide to take the tension out of the situation. But there is an inherent dif difficulty in that relationship. China has been a great country for much of its history, but in the period that prior to the resumption of relations in the terms of measuring power. Uh, China was 
much weaker hmm. than, the, than the United States. Its capacity was to stir up difficulty all over the world by using its diplomatic and potential commercial influence. As China grew in strength, which was inherent in opening the relationship, uh, it, it gained the capacity of threatening the United States in the nature of modern technology. And the nuclear age, from the beginning, raised the issue that countries developing nuclear weapons and the capacity to deliver them were able to inflict the amount of damage that would normally require years of warfare so that therefore their capacity to influence actions by threats grew. That was the dilemma of the nuclear age to begin mm. with. And it was one reason why many of us thought negotiations for the reduction of the threat were important. So with respect to Chinese-American relations, as China grew stronger, and as the American debate became more complicated, as we've discussed earlier, mm. uh, and as the Chinese government changed over the years, uh, the tension became harder and harder to manage. And on the American side, it became a subject which it had not been of domestic politics, so that candidates are now influenced by the degree to which their opponents can accuse them of selling out to China. Or mm. So that is the current problem. However, and it is a unique situation in the sense that the biggest threat of each country is the other. That is, the biggest threat to China is America in their perception. And the same is true here, that the, that the biggest threat On the other hand, wars have become either unwinnable with the advanced weapons or winnable only at costs that are out of proportion. And so I support efforts to negotiate with China, and I have been urging them. There's one, one interesting thing you said. You're you pointed out that in America, the politics has changed because successive yes. leaders and the elections people fight. In China, you've had one leader. You've had Xi Jinping now for over 10 years. So the fact that it's got worse in, in China, is that his fault? What, what, what is, has he gone in the wrong direction? Well, what he has done is the so-called wolf diplomacy. Mm in which Chinese leader, Chinese diplomats were urged, in effect, to throw around their weight. That in re so, so in relations with, say, Australia, which of a dramatic reduction of Chinese trade because of some political and other the statements that had been made, it's a problem a little bit comparable 
to what we discussed before about Germany before 1914, that Germany suddenly became a great power. And after it, uh, Bismarck, its first chancellor, uh, did not know how to apply it in a way that translated into diplomatic results. You describe Deng Xiaoping, for instance, as a great man. Do you think of Xi Jinping as a great man? Well, Xi is Deng Xiaoping had finished his had, had finished his destiny or his role. Yeah. Uh, Xi came in after a cultural revolution which wiped out many of these experienced leaders uh, and I don't describe him now as a great man, but I think he's pursuing goals which might earn him that title and the American president if they achieve a real balancing of relationship between the two countries. What chances do you see of, of, of an invasion of Taiwan sometime in the next three, four years, on the current trajectory of relations? Well, on the current trajectory of relations, I think some military conflict is probable. But I also think the current trajectory of relations must be altered and for the weeks preceding our discussion, there have been signs on both sides of trying to end them. They have not yet actually engaged in the sort of dialogues that, that I suggested, but I think they're moving towards it. Okay. And I leave my mind open in relation to the outcome. The other thing which has happened is that China has got more involved in things beyond its traditional region. You know, you've seen China talking to Zelensky. You saw China brokering a kind of truce between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It should be an inevitable part of these discussions that both sides explain to the, each other what their core interests are and determine how to handle situations in which their core interests clash. And I would hope to resolve interests in which core interests clash without conflict or manage to avoid situations of clashing core interests. At the moment you have India, which is seems to be a non-aligned country. Um, it is not on one side or the other. Would, would, a, would a younger Kissinger now focus from an American point of view of trying to bring India, which will be the next great power, onto the American side? I've no, I've not dealt with India for, in terms of years, even longer than I've dealt with China. Mm. And at the early period of my dealing with India, their non-alignment was a source of considerable irritation because it took the form of lecturing us on the virtues of non-alignment. That choice was open to them, but not to us. When you are in a Cold War, you can't retreat from it and say you're not going to choose non-alignment, but in the decades with which I've dealt with India sen since, I think their policy, their current policy, is extraordinarily thoughtful. 
and I have great respect for their foreign minister, who is a very, I would say, brilliant executor of that, of that policy. India is a great power, and over the decades ahead, it will grow very comparably to China. Uh, maybe not quite to the same strength, but it doesn't matter at that point exactly. It, uh, it will be of sufficient strength to uh, assert itself. And so it performs best when it defends its own interests, which overlap many of ours. Our interests as a great power are to prevent any country from dominating the world or its regions in such a way that we lose our influence to achieve important objectives. The final part of our conversation focused on legacy and the personal side. Henry Kissinger has remained a pretty private person. In an age where leaders like to play on emotional narratives, he has, as we shall shortly see, tended to suppress his backstory, even when it might win him sympathy. One constant in the three decades that I've known him has been football. His first question on seeing me was why had Leicester City, my football team, just been relegated from the Premier League? He has followed Firth, which itself got relegated from the Bundesliga last year since he was a boy. Indeed, he and his brother were beaten up by Nazi thugs for trying to sneak into a game. You have lived 100 years, and Firth has yet to win the Bundesliga. How, how long would you have to live for that to happen? Oh, uh, it would come close to the definition, to giving us a definition of infinity. <laughs> <laughs> I've read a lot of things you've written, and nothing quite as sort of powerful as this. And it's, it was in Neil Ferguson's book. It was a, a private essay you wrote um, when you visited our concentration camp when you aged, I think, just 22. And especially you meet this inmate called Folek Sama. And you say, Folek Sama, your foot has been crushed so that you can't run away. Your face is 40. Your body is ageless, yet all your certificate reads as 16. And I stand there with my clean clothes and make a speech to you and your comrades. Folexama, humanity stands accused in you. I, Joe Smith, human dignity, everybody has failed you. You should be preserved in cement up here on the hillside for future generations to look upon and take stock. Human dignity, objective values have stopped at this barbed wire. As long as conscience exists as a conception in the world, you must personify it. Nothing done for you will ever restore you. You are eternal in this respect. It obviously had a very profound experience in you, but it was something you chose to keep sort of private for a long time. Do you, is it, is that, do you think that's a different way of people seeing Henry Kissinger? It was a feeling that this concentration camp evoked in me. I wrote that um, within a week mm. of having seeing the le level of dehumanization that we can't imagine, that people were too weak to hurt the gods that had uh, kept them. And we killed some people by mistake, by giving them solid food. Uh, but it, so I wrote that for myself. I had no intention of publishing it because feelings about humanity can affect your own actions. A biographer discovered it, mm. not among papers I gave him, but it, ref it reflects an underlying reality that we have to recognize it's lurking behind our technical capacities and that we need to 
contain and prevent from breaking, and to use to prevent the barbaric side from breaking out. When you look back at your life now from the 100-year point of view, do you think that has been we, the, the core of it, is trying to do that? It's been an important core of it, but I don't advertise it. On that thing, I know you're, you're 100, you're talking about writing two more books, but how, how, if not for that, how would you like to be remembered? It's out of my control. I try to do the best I could within the framework that we have discussed. Henry Kissinger, thank you very much for talking to Bloomberg. A very delayed happy birthday. Thank you very much. Thank you.